Hey, thank you to everyone for all the comments you've left on my recent videos. Of course, I love the fact that you've really driven up my engagement, but I do really enjoy helping you guys out with whatever technical issues you're having with Blender or 3D art. Oh, and sorry, not sorry for the annoying royalty-free music. Just an FYI, I have my Discord server up now, so if you need to post a screenshot of whatever technical issues you're having, feel free to drop it in the Help Me Fix channel, and I'll hopefully respond to you as soon as I can. So, while we're on the topic of the many technical issues you might be having, how about we go over the 10 things you should probably avoid doing as a 3D artist. Starting with number one, end guns. Now, as you probably know, an end gun is any face that has more than four vertices. And as you've probably heard from many other sources, you do not want end guns on the topology of your model. And this is true most of the time. You see, there are plenty of instances where an end gun simply isn't hurting anyone. If it's sitting on a flat surface surrounded by a border of quadded topology, then you can fight the urge to go in there with your knife tool and perfectly connect all the vertices within that face. Because should whatever you're modeling be exported to another environment like a game engine, in all likelihood it's going to be triangulated before being exported. But this can even cause further issues, such as if the triangulation method is changed between exports. This will change the pole axis order of vertices, meaning that it changes which vertices are getting connected together to triangulate that face. This will cause immediately apparent shading issues and will warp any textures that you've created for your model. You also can't count on triangulation to save you, especially if you've used a large number of Boolean operations on your model. No triangulation method will be able to appropriately calculate which vertices are supposed to get connected together. Now, end guns are just part of the modeling process, and you're going to be running into a lot of them. Most commonly, you'll see them whenever you generate a cylinder in which the caps are closed with a single face rather than a triangle fan or nothing, or whenever you're doing any Boolean operations or creating a bevel on a single edge. However, you also need to check your models for anywhere where a end gun might have slipped in, such as this single edge here, which has been subdivided, creating this extra vertice, which will no doubt be troublesome. The quickest way to find if your model has any end guns on it is to select a single face that has more than four vertices, then go to the Select tab at the top, go to Select All by Trait, and Faces by Side. From there, you want to make sure that it is checked that you have the number of vertices set to four, and then switch the type from equal to to greater than. Now you will see that it has selected all the faces that are currently sharing more than four vertices. As you become a more experienced 3D artist, you'll probably find your own methods for working around or working with end guns. But as a beginner, it's probably best to avoid end guns because it can easily contribute to bad topology, which is a day giveaway that you're simply inexperienced as an artist. So, as where end guns is something that you can largely attribute to your experience and technical skills as a 3D artist, non-manifold geometry is something that you probably want to avoid entirely. And that brings us to number two. Non-manifold geometry occurs when two faces or two volumes are sharing a single edge or vertice, creating geometry that technically shouldn't be able to exist. And while non-manifold geometry might sound complicated and scary, it's really easy to create. You can create it like this, and like this, and like this. You see this? Don't do this. Because while it might be cool to create some abstract 3D concept, there's really no other use for doing this because of the whole this can't actually exist in reality thing. If non-manifold geometry exists on your model, It'll interfere with everything from rendering properly to modifiers such as subdivisions and booleans, and you can pretty much just forget about 3D printing. While it's easy enough to say don't create non-manifold geometry, there's still several ways that it can slip in on you from time to time. 
such as if you're doing a number of operations and you accidentally merge vertices between two separate volumes, or you accidentally create an interior face somewhere by haphazardly tapping F. Luckily, it's pretty easy to hunt down for and find non-manifold geometry. Just go to the Select tab, select all by trait, and non-manifold. There you go. Destroy it. Number three is what I would call a bad habit when it comes to 3D modeling, and that's vertex tweaking. Vertex tweaking is when you make a long series of small minute transformations to only one or two vertices at a time. Now, there's a time and a place to be making very small transformations, but on the whole, this is not an efficient way to go about modeling, especially for extended periods of time. If you find yourself doing a lot of vertex tweaking, you might want to take a step back and see if there's any more effective ways to accomplish what you're trying to do. Sometimes there might be more efficient tools available for accomplishing a given task than making a bunch of minute changes to a few vertices at a time. Because doing a lot of vertex tweaking is a good way to lead to number four, which is bad topology. In fact, everything we've discussed will probably lead to bad topology. But that's just the thing. Good topology is an art and a science. So take the time to learn basic modeling theory, know the terminology, and learn to avoid the pitfalls of bad topology early on. Trust me, you'll be doing yourself a huge favor. So learn to avoid the things we've already discussed, learn to create geometry with a good flow for the task you're trying to accomplish, learn how to transition between areas of high and low polygon density, and learn how to fuse meshes together efficiently. There, so at this point you should be a god at 3D modeling. But you might still have problems with number 5, which is bad UVs. Because even if you're a total 3D vertice wizard, yeah, you could still mess up in a lot of ways when it comes to UVs if you're trying to texture your model. Creating UVs has always been a very tedious part of the 3D art workflow. Luckily now there are so many other programs and add-ons that help to streamline this process. However, this has also made it easier for beginners to overlook learning the fundamentals of UVs by not having to do the manual processes that are involved and making them more susceptible to falling into these pitfalls. In all likelihood, Smart UV Project is not going to save you in a whole lot of instances, and you're going to have to learn how to efficiently cut seams and unwrap your models. Texel density is an important thing that's good to learn early on when it comes to UVs and texturing. This describes the size of your UV islands and how many pixels of your texture grid are getting allocated to that area. An example of bad texel density would be if you have a single volume that is cut into multiple UV islands. However, those UV islands are scaled differently from one another. On the whole, you usually want a consistent scale between all your UV islands so that they all share a similar texel density. However, there might be areas that are hardly seen or hardly used that you might want to allocate a smaller region of your texture grid to so that they don't consume as much space. Another thing you want to learn when it comes to UVs is when it's appropriate to rectify or align strips of geometry. Doing so can help make parts of your models easier to pack and help that the UV islands consume less space, but can also lead to noticeable UV stretching if not done tactfully. It's also important to consider the rotation of your UV islands. As a general rule, it's probably a good idea to have your UV islands rotated in 90 degree increments. While this isn't always important, it certainly can be for game design, especially if your 3D model has any straight lines or stripe patterns. You see, in a game engine such as Unreal or Unity, they use varying mipmap levels to up-res and de-res the textures based on the distance from the camera or player. This is done to save on computing power. However, if the model that you created has UV islands that are rotated at odd angles and there are any straight lines or stripe patterns on your texture, those straight lines or stripes can get very jagged or aliased as the mipmap down reses your texture. So it's generally a good idea to keep your UV islands rotated in 90 degree increments. Number six is creating too many materials. Now, there's a lot of pitfalls that can occur when it comes to materials, but this is something I would say is more common for beginners. Now, what you're creating might call for a lot of materials in your scene or on your model. 
a character in a AAA video game might be comprised of five, eight, 10, or maybe even more materials, or they might just have one. A lot of this depends on workflow, but just remember that materials can take up a lot of computing power as you go along. Breaking up every single part and accessory of your model and giving it its own material probably isn't an efficient way to go about things. And as with creating UVs, it's equally important to make sure that each object that has a different material is still sharing the same texel density. Conversely, creating multiple materials might be essential for your project, especially if there are different parts of your model that have varying shader requirements. Number seven is using too many add-ons. Now, this can be a bit of a pitfall for beginners because you don't want to clutter your workspace too much and you also don't want to rely on add-ons as a crutch that'll keep you from learning the fundamentals of 3D art and modeling. Having too many add-ons can become cumbersome and can clutter your workflow, and they can even conflict with one another. You also don't want to just try forcefully interjecting an add-on into your workflow when it's really not any more efficient or effective than tools that already exist in your program. And by relying on an add-on rather than learning the fundamentals, it's a good way to fall into a number of pitfalls and commit many of the no-nos we've already discussed in this video. And number eight is not using add-ons. Okay, I know, but once you get proficient and once you understand the fundamentals, you'll realize that there's a lot of areas in Blender or any vanilla software package that you're using that are tedious and time consuming or convoluted and complicated to implement. Every add-on that you use should have a finite set purpose that will all together work to help improve the speed of your workflow. The add-ons that I find most useful are the ones that help to automate my workflow and help to reduce the tedious manual operations that I would otherwise have to make. Number nine is jumping ahead. Going on workflow, it's important to stay attentive at every point in the design process. You don't want to be too anxious to get from one point to another, that you do a sloppy haphazard job on one step and have to correct it much later on when you see the adverse effects. Now, it's good to keep whatever you're working on open to continued refinement and iterations, as you don't want to get too far along in the process and find out that whatever it is that you've been creating is in some way fundamentally broken for the project you're trying to create. Now, finding a good workflow can take time and quite a bit of exploration, but when you do, it's very important to stick to your process. And number 10 is don't overcomplicate things, because it's a lot easier to improve on the design of the wheel than to try reinventing it for yourself. Because even if you make some 3D masterpiece using some uber advanced technical workflow, if it takes too long to create, it may simply not be that viable for a production environment. Overcomplicating things can also make every step in the design process more tedious and cumbersome to handle, as well as increasing the potential for errors to occur. Study what other people have done before you, steal from several sources of inspiration, and improve on the methods that have already been proven to work. Because whether it is just you, or a small team of artists or programmers, or a full AAA studio, at a certain point there is a rate of diminishing returns to the value that your technically cumbersome design process will give to your project. So while you should constantly be learning and improving your design workflow, sometimes simple proven design principles are the best option. I hope that was helpful to some of you. If you need help with anything, feel free to leave a comment or check out the Discord. So long, social media links in the bio, like and subscribe.